a typical uh, uh, what is a typical parkinsonism so they are a group of uh, progressive uh, uh, neurodegenerative disorders a group of progressive neurodegenerative diseases that present with some signs and symptoms of parkinson's disease so there is parkinsonism but with little or no tremor so that's the important point and uh, also they have uh, early speech and balance difficulty compared to the typical form and generally they do not respond well to dopaminergic drugs and so the atypical forms uh, account for about 10 to 15 percent of parkinsonian syndromes so the typical parkinsonism as we just heard is characterized by the presence of bradykinesia as a core feature along with tremor rigidity and postural instability uh, and IPD is asymmetric generally and the resting tremor is a predominant feature whereas in atypical forms tremor is not a regular feature so absence of tremor suggests atypical Parkinsonism typical Parkinsonism responds well to levodopa in comparison to the atypical form so rarely in some atypical forms you may see tremor like PSPP and PSPOS subtypes which I'll be talking about later on but in general tremor is not a feature that you would find in a patient with typical atypical Parkinsonism so absence of tremor this is the first point absence of tremor suggests atypical Parkinsonism so pathologically there's something common to both these conditions both these groups of disorders typical and atypical Parkinsonism they are both associated with abnormal protein buildup in the brain cells which can be one of two main proteins alpha synuclein or tau protein so Lewy body everybody is aware of the Lewy body which is the pathological hallmark of Parkinson's disease uh, the neuronal degeneration of Parkinson's disease is usually accompanied by this Lewy body uh, which is an aggregate of proteins it's not specific for Parkinson's disease even in the general population about 10 percent of people over the age of 60 might have some Lewy bodies and there are some other conditions where patients may have demonstrate Lewy bodies in their brains and Lewy bodies are made up of a protein called alpha synuclein which is a component of a synapse interneuron space and usually it exists in a soluble non-folded form but in a pathological state due to whatever the reason alpha synuclein becomes aggregates and filaments which forms the Lewy bodies which happens to be toxic to the neurons so the other uh, form of protein is the tau protein which uh, are a group of heterogeneous uh, disorders the tau protein caused by this protein uh, which uh, forms into the neurofibrillary uh, and gliofibrillary tangles in the human brain so what disorders are classically considered to be atypical parkinsonisms so there are four uh, conditions which uh, falls into this category of atypical Parkinsonism progressive supranuclear palsy uh, which is a tau protein basically meaning that it involves tau protein buildup in the brain affecting the frontal lobes brain stem cerebellum substantia nigra then multi-system atrophy which is a side nucleopathy uh, so meaning that there's aggregation of alpha synuclein uh, affects the autonomic nervous system substantia nigra and also the cerebellum and there is corticobasal syndrome or corticobasal degeneration is a rare tauopathy which is typically unilateral uh, strikingly asymmetric and makes it difficult to navigate through space for these patients and then of course there is dementia with Lewy bodies which is uh, again uh, due to aggregation of uh, alpha synuclein but in different locations compared to the uh, typical idiopathic forms of Parkinson's disease and uh, this predominantly presents with dementia so they can be either synucleopathies or tauopathies depending on uh, the type of protein which aggregates and the prototype tauopathy of course is Alzheimer's disease 
and the prototype cyclin alpha synucleopathy would be a Parkinson's disease, the idiopathic form. So the second point is patients with Parkinsonism who do not improve with levodopa are unlikely to be having idiopathic Parkinson's disease. That goes to say that most patients with idiopathic disease, almost all, would initially show an excellent response to treatment with levodopa. That is universal. So if you find a patient who's Parkinsonian, having Parkinsonism, who's not responding to levodopa for some reason, it is unlikely that that patient is having uh, idiopathic disease. So these are some of these clinical clues or the red flags uh, uh, that we look for in patients who are having uh, Parkinsonian syndromes or atypical Parkinsonism. So they may have early falls, severe dysautonomia, poor response to levodopa as we discussed, bulbous signs, myoclonus, early onset uh, dementia, rapidly progressing course compared to the idiopathic variety, uh, supranuclear gaze palsy, upper motor neuron signs, cerebellar signs, uh, urinary incontinence, and uh, swinter involvement, early symptomatic postural hypotension. So these are some other signs which makes you think twice and you have to consider about the possibility of something other than idiopathic disease if you have these signs in a patient who is having Parkinsonism. So you have to be aware of the other conditions and think of those. Uh, these are the clinical clues you would get and they are sometimes called the red flags as well. So we'll take one by one progressive supranuclear palsy. Uh, in the classical form, PSP phenotype would be characterized by postural instability, which occurs early on, unexplained early falls, early cognitive dysfunction, abnormalities of vertical gaze. So these are the classical four features that you would come across in patients with PSP. Um, and this classical form is known as the Rich Richardson syndrome. So this is uh, Clifford Richardson, who is one of the three people who described this uh, condition in 1964. They wrote up the first article on the nine patients they saw with this condition uh, into a paper and uh, in the slide, you see some of the uh, notes that uh, he has recorded from some of these patients. Uh, something new they saw. Uh, so, so the classic variety is known as the Richardson syndrome. So if you get Parkinsonism in a patient with ocular motor dysfunction, which includes, of course, the vertical gaze palsy, slow vertical saccades, square wave jerks, reduced blinking, oily dyspraxia, any of those ocular motor dysfunctions, postural instability, echinesia, uh, early gait freezing within the three years of the disease onset, of course, and cognitive decline. These features would suggest that the patient probably has something other than the idiopathic variety of Parkinson's disease, which is uh, progressive supranuclear palsy. PSP. So PSP, uh, there are more clinical clues. Usually the onset of PSP is after the age of 40 and they have this classic rocket sign where the patients fall back into the chair when they stand, they try to get up. And they have the axial rigidity, frontal release signs, pseudobulbar palsy, surprise look. They have this searing kind of look, uh, symmetric Echinacea. So the disease is symmetric as uh, compared to idiopathic disease and retrocolis and hypophonia as well. So some of the features uh, mentioned at the bottom of this slide, alien limb syndrome, unexplained dysautonomia, drug, non-drug hallucinations, sense, cortical sensory deficit and cortical uh, Alzheimer-like dementia generally excludes uh, PSP. So these are some of the radiological features. Now in diagnosing these cases, it's not an easy uh, condition to diagnose. The, all these atypical forms are uh, 
uh, with uh, atypical forms also we don't have biomarkers just like the idiopathic variety as damit mentioned we don't have a, a specific biomarker or a test to come to a diagnosis so we had to rely on the clinical presentation it's largely a clinical diagnosis but of course certain things help like imaging so radiological clues are there uh, in the case of uh, uh, psp of course we have the neuroimaging features the well known hummingbird sign atrophy of the upper mid brain head and beak extending anteriorly towards the optic chiasm and uh, of course the pons is paired so that would be the body of the bird so that is uh, the classical sign called the hummingbird sign the other one is the morning glory sign um, concavity of the lateral margin of the mid brain tegmentum both these signs are highly specific more than 95% specificity uh, but of course the sensitivity is low so that's the difficulty uh, it's uh, comparatively low sensitivity and uh, they do not correlate directly with the duration of the disease or the severity of the disease so this is the morning glory sign once again and the mickey mouse appearance sometimes they can get uh, due to uh, anteroposterior midline uh, mid brain diameter being uh, narrow because of the uh, mid brain atrophy so the fourth point is radiological or mri brain features of psp are highly specific over 90% specificity but unfortunately they have a very low sensitivity uh, approximately 35 to 50% so they do not correlate well with the disease duration or the severity so there are many subtypes uh, of psp uh, so it's a real diagnostic challenge i just mentioned the classic form which is the psp richardson syndrome then there are many other forms which i have listed here in this slide there are about eight other different phenotypes of uh, psp uh, psp p which is predominantly parkinsonism uh, psp with uh, poa kinesia with gait freezing then psp with cortico basal syndrome psp with predominant language and speech dysfunction so there are many such different uh, combinations of uh, psp uh, the in the very classic pure form it would be the richardson syndrome as mentioned earlier so these uh, again uh, there are different different uh, presentations clinically sometimes you might be able to get some clues with regards to the uh, different phenotype uh, of uh, psp um, but of course i have to mention that it is there are there a lot of overlap and it will not be easy to make a clinical distinction of the type oh, of PSP and the phenotype. In, uh, so there are also uh, PSP lookalikes, which uh, makes the diagnosis uh, a little difficult sometimes, but uh, it is important to pick them out because some of these conditions can be treated uh, more effectively than PSP. So I think uh, it's important for you to look for these conditions, especially with the availability of genetic testing now we are in a, a better position to diagnose some of these conditions like the Perry syndrome, the young onset PSP like presentation, autosomal dominant Parkinsonism, psychiatric symptoms, loss of weight, respiratory failure, central hypoventilation uh, due to a, a gene mutation. Then of course the Niman peak C with prominent uh, ataxia, upgaze palsy and uh, gelastic cataplexy. So all these patients do have vertical gaze palsy, uh, supranuclear gaze palsy. So it might be uh, uh, important to differentiate this uh, from the classic form of PSP. kufar is also one such condition and sometimes in Gaucher's disease. So they will all have the supranuclear gaze palsy. So as uh, with most of these conditions, there's no disease modifying drug to treat them. Uh, there's no neuroprotective treatment yet. And uh, symptomatic treatment also is less effective than in the case of idiopathic disease, as we just mentioned. So uh, of course, you can use a trial of levodopa. You have to use very high doses of levodopa in these cases, uh, up to one gram a day. And amantadine, a 
up to about 250 milligrams a day sometimes it is effective um, you can use botulinum toxin for rigidity and dystonia they have different forms of dystonia they may have retrocolis uh, cervical dystonia and sometimes they do have blepharospasm uh, eyelid apraxia is also sometimes and you you can use botox botulinum toxin for some of these conditions then uh, other supportive treatment and swallowing can be a problem because they can develop pseudobulbar weakness and peg insertion might have to be done a little early in some cases then we move on to multiple system atrophy the second condition uh, which affects men and women both equally and usually around the sixth decade of life fifth to sixth decade of life with Parkinsonism, autonomic failure and cerebral ataxia. So those two features make it a little different from the others, autonomic failure and cerebral ataxia. Um, and they may have pyramidal signs in any combination. So there are two major types of MSA that we talk about, the MSA P and C. P is the Parkinsonian type, uh, which is the common one, about 80%. Then the C is cerebellar, which is about 20%. So MSAP deteriorates more rapidly functionally, but of course the survival times of both these conditions are uh, almost equal. So important thing here is somebody have, we coming to you with Parkinsonism, but also has cerebellar signs, also has autonomic failure without drugs uh, being used, uh, because most of the drugs like levodopa, it causes autonomic uh, postural uh, hypotension, but if the patient had not been used in using uh, levodopa, so autonomic failure, cerebral ataxia uh, would be clues uh, to thinking uh, of this possibility uh, of uh, MSA. So Parkinsonism is the initial feature uh, in MSAP in a large number of patients, and then of course there's autonomic and urinary dysfunction, orthostatic hypotension with a systolic blood pressure dropping to 30 millimeters, diastolic blood pressure 15 millimeters after standing for three minutes. So uh, orthostatic uh, hypotension would be an important uh, clue as to whether this is a case of MSA. Um, then of course, orofacial dyskinesia, sleep related problems, cognition is not so much affected as opposed to as compared to PSP. Um, eye movement disorders also are not as common, but can occur. Then, of course, there's stridor sometimes in these patients and axial dystonia, which might give you the appearance of a PISA syndrome uh, or an early severe camptochomia, which is a late feature of the idiopathic variety of Parkinson's disease. Uh, camptochomia also can be an early feature in some cases of MSA. So point five is MSA is typically characterized by Parkinsonism, autonomic dysfunction, and a combination of uh, cerebellar and pyramidal signs. So radiological clues, again, uh, MRI can be useful. Brain MRI might show uh, the putaminal uh, atrophy and hyperintensity of the putaminal ring, which is known uh, as uh, the putaminal sign. Uh, ring sign. Uh, so uh, it is in uh, the MRI on the uh, left hand side shows that. Uh, then, of course, the famous hot cross bun sign uh, you would see predominantly in patients with MSAC, bilateral cerebral atrophy uh, with uh, evidence of the hot cross bun sign across the uh, pons. Um, and uh, of course, hot cross bun sign is uh, not uh, only seen in uh, MSA, it can be seen in some other conditions like some forms of spinocerebral ataxia, cerebral vasculitis, variant CJD, and so on. So, hot cross bun sign refers to the MRI appearance of the pons. Uh, T2 hyperintensities forms uh, across uh, on axial images representing selective degeneration of the pontocerebellar tracts. So this indicates that hot cross bun sign. 
Then of course the putaminal ring sign, as I mentioned earlier, which is more commonly seen in MSAP. So the putaminal ring sign can be seen in a 1.5 Tesla machine. But of course, if you go and do a MRI in, in a three Tesla machine, even in a normal individual, sometimes you might see this. So there's no discriminatory value in such situations, but still it might be useful in a clinical scenario, in the correct clinical scenario. So coming back to treatment again, mostly symptomatic treatment. Of course, your Parkinsonian part can be treated with the leodopa as usual, but uh, with limited response. Uh, orthostatic hypotension, high sol, fluidocortisone, and so on, and urinary dysfunction, neurogenic bladder. They also have erectile dysfunction, the men. And uh, so you'll have to address all these issues and depression and, uh, and so on. So this is largely symptomatic management for these patients. Then again, MSA also has some lookalikes uh, with cerebellar features, cerebellar ataxia, uh, fragile extrema ataxia syndrome. These are some of these are rare conditions, but uh, nevertheless important because some of them can be treated, uh, especially CTX, uh, cerebrotendinous xanthomatosis, which can be treated. So these conditions can sometimes mimic MSA and it's important to recognize them uh, with the appropriate clinical features uh, tendons and tumors and so on in these patients and then appropriately treat uh, um, them. Um, right, so we move on to the third condition known as corticobasal degeneration, which is the least common and the most difficult to diagnose sometimes also. So classically, it consists of asymmetric Parkinsonism as opposed to the other two conditions we mentioned. So this is uh, more asymmetric, uh, more like the idiopathic variety, I would say, but of course with uh, different uh, features. So they have cortical signs, apraxia, uh, cortical sensory loss, and of course the alien limb, which is well known uh, in cortical basal degeneration, dystonia and myoclonus. So this combination, dystonia, myoclonus with cortical signs, alien limb, and asymmetric Parkinsonism uh, usually uh, is seen in the classical forms of CBD. So CBD has uh, motor and higher cortical diagnostic criteria because those two in combination would rise, give rise to the condition CBD. So you have the limb rigidity, echinacea, limb dystonia, myoclonus, higher cortical signs as li listed there, the alien limb, cortical sensory, orobuccal or limb apraxia. So, so there is probable and possible CBD because it's again a clinical diagnosis based on these features. Uh, so you have to go by uh, the amount of uh, motor and high cortical signs and come to a clinical diagnosis of uh, CBD. So point six is the classical CBD phenotype consists of asymmetric Parkinsonism, cortical signs, apraxia and limb, uh, alien limb. Uh, possibly other signs like dystonia and myoclonus. So following features may exclude uh, CBD like early dementia, vertical gaze palsy, tremor, which is a rest tremor, severe autonomic disturbance and sustained response to levodopa. So again, uh, treatment is largely symptomatic uh, in this condition as well. So there are a few lookalikes for CBD also. They may be uh, rare conditions, but uh, you have to think of possibilities like frontotemporal lobe degeneration uh, and Alzheimer's disease, pre mutations, and so on. These are rare conditions which might uh, look alike CBD. When you are making a diagnosis of CBD, it's better if you exclude these conditions as well. And there's this condition known as anti icton 5 disease, uh, which is a treatable condition. Uh, it's uh, with immunotherapy mostly, uh, which can present with uh, features suggestive of an atypical uh, Parkinsonism, with ataxia, sometimes even chorea, dysautonomia, bulbar symptoms. Uh, so it's a taupathy, uh, so which can be uh, successfully treated in some cases. Uh, with uh, immunotherapy. So it's a treatable condition. So might as well 
think about this also in these condition patients uh, when going through the workup. So uh, a quick recap, uh, multiple system atrophy is relatively symmetric, characterized by Parkinsonism, combination of autonomic corticospinal and cerebellar dysfunction, cognition mostly intact, PSP relatively symmetric, characterized by Parkinsonism, early falls, supranuclear gaze pollution and other ocular motor involvement, uh, gaze involvement, and cognition is significantly impaired. Corticobasal ganglionic degeneration typically very symmetric, asymmetric, sorry, asymmetric and characterized by both cortical as well as basal ganglionic features uh, and cognition gets affected only later. So the fourth condition is dementia with Lewy bodies, the predominantly a dementing illness. Uh, core clinical features would be Parkinsonism again with fluctuating uh, cognition and pronounced variation in attention and alertness. Recurrent visual hallucinations in a drug naive patient who's not on any drug which can cause hallucinations. So again, you have a, a way of making a diagnosis of probable DLB or possible DLB. Again, not easy to make this diagnosis. Sometimes the diagnosis is not made in life, like uh, but happens in certain cases. Um, um, so there are other suggestive features like REM sleep behavioral disorders uh, and uh, also the dopamine uptake in spectopic scans and so on. So you would be able to make a diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, again, um, it might be useful, uh, levodopa might be useful in these cases, but they have a, a significant uh, uh, neuroleptic sensitivity. So you, you cannot uh, use neuroleptics freely in these conditions also. So what is um, atypical, atypical Parkinsonism? So patients who have uh, features that are atypical within the current criteria of classical atypical phenotypes. So they are, they are put into these groups of different conditions like PESP, CBD, MSA, but they are having atypical features within the atypical ones. So these are uh, difficult to diagnose and also uh, the pathologies underlying these conditions can mimic uh, the condition we mentioned already, but they may have a different form of uh, disorder. And there are many drug trials on these cases also, and there may be, genetic, may be a genetic basis uh, for these. So it's important sometimes to uh, find out because it might not fall into the typical categories as we mentioned. So there are a lot of overlap. So, Atypical, atypical Parkinsonisms are new genetic conditions presenting with features of progressive supranuclear palsy, corticobasal degeneration, and multiple system atrophy. So that's point seven. So the difficulty here we are having is to separate them out because we don't have a biomarker. So there are many, many uh, studies going on to look for biomarkers for these conditions. And uh, out of them, the neurofilament light chains, total alpha cyanuclein and soluble amyloid precursor protein, alpha and beta. These are the things that they are looking into in the CSF of these patients. And they have the closest way of uh, uh, separating out uh, these conditions from the idiopathic variety of Parkinson's disease. So some of them seems to be promising at the moment. So diagnostic delays, this point eight, are common in atypical Parkinson's syndromes in the absence of specific biomarkers. So heterogeneous presentations make it even more difficult to diagnose. So PSP has at least eight distinct phenotypes and CBD about four and MSA three respectively. So it is important that we have some kind of biomarker to get to a diagnosis of these conditions. So some of these symptoms these patients have like uh, Additional symptoms, constipation, blepharospasm, dystonias, and depression, pain, sleep uh, problems, and so on. Mental uh, illnesses can be treated. And depression can be another major problem in these cases. So this has to be addressed when dealing with these cases. So uh, mental illnesses can be common 
they may have depression uh, commonly in, in these patients. Um, then the last point is uh, yeah, because uh, the progressive supranuclear pulse is a tau path, it is reasonable to expect that tau could be a useful biomarker. So elevated levels of tau has been seen in uh, globus pallidus uh, of uh, uh, patients uh, with uh, PSP, the typical variety, the Richardson form, even with low disease severity. So sometimes they are looking into the possibility of finding out whether there, are, uh, there is tau detectable in the CSF in life. And of course the uh, tau PET scan which might be useful in the future to separate them out. So and also they are in the lookout for treatment, specific treatment with anti-tau protein. Uh, various studies are going on on this. So the 10 pearls I would just uh, summarize. So absence of tremor in a patient with Parkinsonism makes it more likely to be atypical. So patients with Parkinsonism who do not improve with levodopa are unlikely to be, be having idiopathic Parkinson's disease. Parkinsonism with oculomotor dysfunction, postural instability, akinesia and cognitive decline suggests PSP. Radiological features of PSP are highly specific, but unfortunately they have a low sensitivity and also they do not correlate well with disease duration or severity. MSA is typically characterized by Parkinsonism, autonomic dysfunction and combination of cerebellar and pyramidal signs. So autonomic dysfunction, cerebellar and pyramidal signs. Atypical, atypical Parkinsonism are new genetic disorders which have in addition to the typical uh, features found in these different different syndromes, there are there is overlap. So it's important to recognize them. And since we are able to go into genetics, we may be able to uh, separate them out and treat them better. Uh, diagnostic delays are common in atypical Parkinsonian syndromes in the absence of specific biomarkers. Mental illnesses are common among patients with atypical Parkinsonism. Tau PET could potentially be useful for identifying early.